for the morning. Uh, my name is Susana Milão. First, I'm going to make a brief presentation of the conference, and then uh, we'll start uh, with 20 minutes, as you know. Uh, well, first we have the, um, the presentation of uh, Diana. Diana Alvariak from Middle East Technology University from Turkey. And uh, the, with the author Rui Colasso from Lisbon University, um, Portugal. Um, well, she's going to be the first uh, conference. She's going to be the, um, to present the first conference of Z tolerance, three-dimensional abstract representations of the immigration issues in Europe. Well, the second one is going to be Ana Luisa Maffini at the right side. Ana Luisa Maffini is from Rio Grande do Sul Federal University, Brazil. And the other author is Clarice Marachin. And the title is Urban Segregation and Social Spatial Interactions, a Configurational Approach. Uh, the third presentation is with Ana Luisa Rolin at the left hand side. Larissa Gomes um, from Pernambuco Catholic University from Brazil is the other author. And also Ana Luiz is from the same university. The subject design strategies and sexism, sexism in the domestic spaces, a critical analysis of three modernist social housing icons. Last one, Catarina uh, Ruivo. Uh, Katerina, you know, Katerina is from the house. So Katerina uh, is from the organization from Portugal and she's making the presentation SCAVA, Space Configuration Access Accessibility and Visibility Analysis, a 3D Space Syntax Approach. And the other authors are also known from you, Franklin, David and George Vaz. Well, 20 minutes for its presentation. At the end, I uh, hope we will have time. It depends on the organization. We have the debate. So we'll start now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I am Jana Nalbayrak Kulasu. I'm a PhD student in Middle East Technical University. Uh, today, I'm not going to present you something related with my thesis, but I'm going to present a side project that we, uh, prop uh, we made a proposal for an exhibition that uh, aims to raise awareness to migration issues in Europe. And we name this exhibition Z Tolerance. Uh, migration is the highlight of sensitive deba debates with uh, increasing media, uh, media focus. And these issues are mainly represented by charts, statistics, uh, proportions, numbers. But in this study, we propose to use a, a visual abstract language to, to address these issues. And in, within the uh, context of our research, we use the migrant as an uh, umbrella term to refer to someone that moved away from their country uh, permanently or semi-permanently due to some social, economic and cultural reasons. Uh, within the context, uh, context of this paper, we specifically studied three cases of current migration issues. Um, even though the general tendency in the media is to address uh, migration as a state of crisis, it doesn't uh, necessarily represent a state of crisis. And even some countries uh, are trying to promote migration to their country by offering uh, legal advantage rights to the migrants. For example, uh, Portugal is, is giving residency rights to foreign investors through the Golden Visa program. And this uh, Golden Visa program uh, in the recent years uh, get, uh, attracted many Turkish people to live and invest in Portugal. Not only through Golden Visa and not only through the investments, but also Portugal is now giving uh, nationality to the Sephardic Jews. And the second aspect uh, we studied is, the, is related to the strengthening border, borders. The uh, fortified border between Spain and uh, Morocco obviously uh, is, uh, is contrast with the previous case I mentioned with Portugal, inviting migrants. And uh, the third aspect uh, we studied is the crossing uh, forbidden borders. We studied this aspect through the relationship of Tunisia and Italy. This is an interesting topic, keeping in mind that until 1980s, the Tunisians didn't even need a visa to enter Italy. And uh, we decided to use Islamic geometric patterns to address these migration issues as a, a general language. 
Uh, Islamic geometric patterns are the mostly used visual element in Islamic art and architecture. Even though their final composition is very complex, the generation rule for these patterns are very simple. A compass and a ruler are only the tools needed to draw and design these patterns. And uh, most of the Islamic patterns uh, are based on representation and tessellation of a single motif into a more complex uh, composition. According to the symmetry and the use, or, uh, use of grid are the main uh, design principles. Uh, these regular uh, design principles makes Islamic ge geometric patterns very, uh, very easily, uh, very suitable for algorithmic generation because they follow basic simple rules. Uh, not only this aspect, but the second aspect why we decided to use Islamic geometric patterns is because due to the overlap of where we see Islamic geometric patterns uh, uh, is intersects with the observed, uh, uh, observed uh, follow of people in the European migration, uh, namely North Africa, South Europe, and Middle East. And dealing with the migration, it is very important to understand how changing points of view uh, shifts per, uh, perception. And the anamorphosis delivers the same message through the physical distortion of perspective. Anamorphosis has several meanings, but there are basically two types of anamorphism. First one uh, is the, is in the first one, the distorted images gain shape and gain meaning when we looked from a, a specified, specific point, a specified, a specific standing point. And in the second time, we, the, um, the distortion of the image is more complex and we need a mirror or a lens to see the image and to, uh, for image to gain meaning. And since anamorphosis also follows the rules or per rules of perspective, uh, they are uh, and their rule-based nature makes them also proper for uh, uh, algorithmic generation as well. Um, we use uh, parametric modeling in our uh, in our uh, design, and we use this uh, type of formal method in order to translate the the migration issues that are generally represented by a daily language into a visual language. So we use the parametric modeling as a, as a translator. And our parametric model involves two stages. Uh, first stage is, a gen uh, is the anamorphic for generation of the anamorphic form. And the second stage is uh, related to the, uh, how we are gonna build this uh, flying lines. And uh, we wanted to, our, uh, final, uh, our final object need to be a buildable structure that can be uh, uh, manufactured by CAM technologies. And specifically in this case, we use PETG transparent sheets and CNC cutter. Uh, first, we defined an outlining cube. And uh, in this outlining cube, uh, we have two Islamic patterns, each Islam, um, two Islamic patterns in the, Mm, uh, y equal to zero plane, we define an Islamic geometric pattern from migrant sending country. And in the uh, x equal to zero plane, we define an Islamic geometric pattern from the migrant receiving country, uh, in the cases that I had previously mentioned, three cases. And then we calculate the minimum number of control points in order to draw this, uh, these patterns. And then we merge them into the 3D, uh, into the into the cube, 3D outlining cube. And uh, here, uh, the control points of the first Islamic pattern from the migrant uh, sending country are merged into the uh, control points of the migrant uh, receiving country. For the x-coordinates, it was direct forward that the control points of uh, control, the x-coordinates of, uh, of the merge uh, of the 3D object are derived from the pattern that is defined in XZ plane, and Y coordinates of the control points are divided from the pattern that is defined in YZ plane. Uh, however, he, the, here the key point is the definition of the Z, uh, Z control points because this information is derived from these two specified patterns, and we need to find the convergence for these points. Accordingly, uh, we, decide, we came up with the idea of defining this Z control, uh, Z, uh, the merge points as within a uh, tolerance value. That also the tolerance named our exhibition. And uh, 
according to these different Z tolerance values, we can we could uh, generate different design design alternatives. That uh, and but through this process, we also wanted to deliver some migration um, aspects. And here we studied three three uh, cases, which is exclu uh, social and cultural exclusion, integration, and assimilation. When the Z tolerance values are so small, are, are not so small, are zero, the, the Z control points cannot merge into a 3D form. And when the Z tolerance values are so high, uh, the, the patterns can merge, but sometimes one pattern deforms so much that it loses readability and it loses its basic design principles. Uh, through this uh, defined definition of Z tolerance value, what we wanted to re uh, represent is the tensions arising from merging of different cultures. In our physical case, it is the merging of different Islamic geometric patterns. And um, in our cases that we decided to build, we always use the Z uh, tolerance values for the case of integration or exclusion and assimilation. So uh, within the context of this study, we built uh, three installations. First one, uh, we we use the Islamic pattern from uh, stone carvings of, uh, uh, of Akmedrese in Turkey. And we merge it with the, the, a tile pattern from a National tile, tile Museum in Lisbon. This is the uh, model. Uh, in the second case, uh, a pattern on a wooden door panel in a zouk in Marrakesh in Morocco is merged with a tile pattern uh, of um, Alcazar of Se Sevilla in Spain. In our third uh, model, uh, we uh, use a tile pattern from the Qibla wall in the Great Mosque of Cairo with a tile pattern from Montreal Cathedral in Palermo, Italy. And after the, this, uh, the, our the design process didn't finish with designing these installations because we also needed to specify the specific standpoints for the um, people who visit exhibition to, that they, can, they have to stand in a specific position to, uh, for these uh, geometric patterns to come into the meaning and they, they could see the, these patterns. And uh, we used some, uh, some mathematical hand calculations with photographic techniques to calculate these specific standing points. And uh, in, uh, as a continuation of our research, we propose to uh, also computationally compute these uh, standing points. There are a lot of previous work related to anamorphism and migration, but uh, our um, uh, our contribution in this research was uh, mainly on two points. First one is that not only through the uh, final form, but the form finding process, we wanted to represent uh, these, uh, these, uh, these migration issues. So we designed each step of our process to uh, have some uh, background meaning for this with, uh, and background relation with these migration issues. And uh, through, parametric, through the mixed use of parametric modeling, mathematical calculations, and photographic techniques, we try to develop a, a formalized method for the perception-based aspect of the anamorphic perspective. And thank you for listening. Good morning, almost good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ana Luisa, I'm from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Uh, so this work was a previous study and a beginning of uh, my dissertation study. I'm a master's student in, in the university 
And we, uh, I work on this with my supervisor, Clarice Maraskin. So we were trying to study urban segregation from the perspective of the social spatial interactions and trying to find ways of measuring it. So we start with the idea that space is an integral part of the outsider problem. The way in which space is organized affects the perception of the other, either as a foreign and threatening or as simply different. So the idea was that by being able to interact with or see the other, see the different people, we were able to have a, a better empathy towards the other and not just consider it a completely threatening. So the main ideas of segregation that we start using and approaching was from the idea of restriction of interaction from Freeman. And then usually in architecture and urban planning, we see it as separation. And it can be separation of people, activities, and functions. And Vilasa also talks about any form of exclusion that manifests itself in a special manner in the city. So there are two main approaches to segregation, which is the geographical and the sociological approach. Historically, the geographical approach has been more used when it comes to urban planning and architecture studies of segregation, which is uh, analyzing the locational patterns of housing. And especially in Brazil, that's the main approach that's been doing. But with the development of new technologies and better ways of gathering data and information, it's been now easier to uh, to study segregation from a, from a morphological configuration approach, which takes in consideration the description of segregation with relationships between people, activity, and spaces, and they can account for the daily routines of individuals and their movement in the public spaces. So one is not an evolution of the other, no, neither is it better, it's just a different approach that now with the new data information it's been easier to, to study. So the main goal of the, the work was to analyze segregation as a restraint of social spatial, social spatial interactions and to seek new forms of evaluating and measuring in a more relevant, spatially, in a spatially more relevant way. So we present a methodology of analysis using configurational models and we develop an empirical application in a small Brazilian city Bibiruba, which is in South Brazil. So to better understand how we are approaching this, we have to take in account the Latin America context, where segregation is basically from social economic roots. Uh, we do have uh, gender segregation and racial segregation, but when it manifests in space, it's usually social economic segregation. And Brazil is the largest economy in Latin America, but it ranks amongst the highest indicators of income inequality in the world. It's the 10th most unequal country in the world, and the first in income concentration among the richest 1% of the population. So when we approach this from a urban spatial configuration, we consider that models are simplified representations of reality, so they are they don't account for everything that has in the city. It needs to have some simplifications. And they assume that city can present hierarchical patterns of spatial differenti differentiation that influence other aspects. We use methodologies of disaggregating the city into components and their relationships. We use that through the graph theory that provides the analytical basis for the calculation. And the models they all assume the shortest path hypothesis. And for that, the city, any city would uh, exhibit a special differentiation. So in here, we see how the city map is transformed in street segment representation that then is read by a software as a graph representation. So because we use street segment representation, every segment of a street between two corners is one segment 
and then that segment becomes a node in the graph representation, and its relation to, all, to the other segments becomes the links in the graph. There has been other studies about this. Uh, Feitosa, which is a Brazilian author, is studying it using indexes of evenness and clustering, exposure and isolation. Uh, and Legeb is studying the co-presence co values using spatial syntax. And Vinicius Neto is study segregation with the possibility of encounters, and he has been he has done some studies considering the movements of people using different transportation modes. So the methodology that we are uh, proposing and approaching analyzes segregation as uh, based on configurational models. We use a centrality model to represent the probability of interaction between individuals from different socioeconomic strata. We build two scenarios regarding to high and low income resident flows towards the retail shops. We compare those two scenarios and try to identify the spaces with the higher and lower potentials for interaction in the city. And from that, we grasp a first measure of segregation. So the centrality property uh, is a property of a cell being along the path that connects to other cells and their hierarchy is given by the total number of times this one cell appears in the paths connecting all pairs of cells of a system. We are using the weighted between the centrality uh, because it, it considers tensions, it takes into account attributes and the, the, the relation with the distance. So the tension reflects the relationship between two points expressed by the product of its content, its attributes. And the distance refers to the extension of the shortest path between each pair of points, and it increases as the centrality of each cell interposed by the path, in the path decreases. So it allows for compu computing the tensions generated between activities in the system, working as an indicator of the social flow of individuals moving through the spatial system to perform those activities. And here we have the the mathematical formula for this. And um, for us, the biggest importance of using the weighted between the centrality was to be able to add the attributes and take into account the distance, because when we're talking about segregation, distance had a, a very, it was a very important attribute for us. So the steps for the methodology were to represent the city as a network, defining the discrete units of urban space to be used. We chose street segments because we are considering the geographical distance. So for us to use uh, Excel maps, the distance would be, I forgot the word in English. It wouldn't be the best approach to use the actual map, so we went with street segments. We use data from the Brazilian Institute of Geographic and Statistic. Because it was a small city that we could check uh, every street to see if matched the real one, we were able to use OpenStreetMap to update because the data we have from the IBGE was from 2010, so there were a little bit of changes. We use data on the residents corresponding to the amount of population in each street segment also from the IBGE data. And they provided a network of these sectors in a shapefile format, which we use in the GIS environment, and the total population were distributed then through the district segments. So this is the city of Ibiruba. We, we, we had to draw the street segments map and then turn into the, the graph. We had to distinguish the residents by income strata. So we defined them in three different categories. Low, which were families up to three and a half minimum wage, medium and high. That was also a, a very difficult part because we had to consider the economics of the city because 
One, minimum wage for a small town in the countryside had a different impact than a minimum wage in the capital of the state. So all of that had to be taken into account and compared with reality. And the, the value of the minimum wages was from 2010, so it was very low in Brazil at the time. That's why the minimum wages are separated in the, in the way. We had to obtain the data for the retail establishment, which we did in a few research. And the data relating the attributes of the population and the retail activities were organ organized in tables in the GIS environment and imported to the software Medidas Urbanas to perform the configurational analysis. We, for this paper, we used all the retail establishment as the same level of attract attractiveness. We do not dis distinguish them by number of employees or the size or anything. We used the geometrical distance and the results obtained were then reintroduced to the GIS platform for us to, to be able to evaluate and compare the two, the two results. So Ibirubá is a city that has three main districts because two districts are very rural. We chose to only use the, the more urban one. It has an, a population of approximately 20,000 inhabitants. And this is the distribution of residents by income. In here is the downtown area. And here we have new social housing projects that don't show up because the data is from 2010. The new housing projects are later. And also we had a difficulty with the calculation because this is um, a road that passes by the city that has a very high flow of trucks and transportation for industry, so people avoid using the, the, this road. And if we had used the topological calculation, this would show up as just one step and would alter the results. And these are the location of the retail establishment and they are very much concentrated in the downtown and the main avenue. And this was our first result of the weighted centrality for the high income strata. We can see that the paths with the highest results were all around the downtown. And in the results for the weighted centrality in low income strata, also the, the highest results are in downtown but they start to shift towards where the people are, are living. And then we have to make a comparison. For that, we use a bivariate map analysis in which we gather the results for the high income strata and divide it in three categories, A, B, and C. And for the results in the low income strata, we divide it in one, two, and three. We then made the comparison, and the results we were most interested were the 1A, which was the most likely results for encounter, where there was a, a high value for both income strata, and 1C and 3A were the results that we considered there would be more, more segregation, where there was the least likely for, for encounter. When we did the comparison, the only result that we were interested that appeared was the 1A. The 1C and 3A did not show up because when we thought that the reason for that, that was what we believe is, because all the retail establishment is in the downtown, everybody has to go downtown. So it's not segregated city when it comes to retail establishment. The path people use, they all shop in the same places. So the conclusions were that we were aim to demonstrate how a, a configurational methodology could be used for identifying segregation or not. And it allows for us to use different social attributes and special factors, like uh, because we only use retail establishments on this one, but we, you, you could use any attributes you could use for shopping, for studying, working, 
anything. And also the modeling implies simplification based on the data available, but you could, if you had the data, you could add as much attributes as you like. Uh, you could consider the transport system people use, high income people have different transportation access than the low income, so all of that could be applied to, the, to this methodology. We did not use because we did not have the data or the time for that, but that all could be done. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, late morning. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Ana Luisa. I'm here to present uh, Larissa's uh, work, actually, that was done in her undergrad uh, thesis last year. Um, <clears throat> so it's, I consider it's an initial approach to sort of a classic space syntax type of analysis uh, that was pretty much motivated by what was happening in Brazil uh, back then, uh, last year. <clears throat> So this was, is our current president. Uh, it's, it, you're probably familiar with the scenario in Brazil a little bit. But last year, in, uh, Women's Day, <clears throat> he went on TV and all kinds of uh, media and stated what he thought about women. And um, so I just highlight here uh, the sort of most dramatic part of his speech, which is women are beings that belong to the home. And, um, and, and so forth. It went on for about, uh, I don't know how, how long this speech was, but there were a lot of, lots of students trying to address this scenario. Is it really the case? And Larissa's uh, work um, is, it goes into investigating uh, if domestic space translates that or not. Um, another motivation was what the UN, um, United Nations, uh, mentioned that uh, an uneven division of household uh, chores um, plays a big, big uh, role in um, sort of the disadvantage of women in terms of uh, um, how much women, how many women actually have formal jobs. Um, obviously, this has been seen through um, advertising, specifically these are American, North American advertising where it seems that uh, domesticity is always, uh, or tends to be uh, represented uh, by the, human, uh, the woman uh, presence of, or character, if you will. So the man sits here while the woman is back there and, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so the overall question was to ask if architecture somehow um, confirms that or if there's some shifts in, in three uh, iconic projects that were all supposedly done uh, under some socialist ideas. Um, <clears throat> so the, the three projects that we will look at, sorry, I don't know if you can, look the, can see the red. Um, they all have collective spaces, uh, such as kitchens and laundries. And um, they, were, they emerged in a context where uh, there were attempts, I cannot show in the paper, you can read more about it, that the context when they occurred, there was already talk about dissociating women from household uh, activities. So these are the, the cases we'll try to present here. Uh, so Russian project, Narconfin, the Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier, and uh, Pedregulho, or Mendes Rocha complex in Rio de Janeiro. In, in common, they were all uh, built somehow, considering rationalized or industrialized principles into at least the conception. I wouldn't say construction per se. And uh, incorporating collective uh, housekeeping services. Um, and uh, the, the idea was that we, we would look at that, especially in relation to the cell, the housing unit cell, if by having this sort of collective equipment, um, the spatial relations in the unit would have some sort of alteration, as opposed to being segregated and as, as it happens in most cases. So um, this is the structure here of what we are going to look at. And uh, of course, I'm not going to read that because I think we've been talking about this, but the, ba the theoretical basis and analytical basis of the investigation relies on space syntax basic uh, principles um, <clears throat> and 
the idea that uh, uh, of, uh, of genotypes uh, borrowed from Julian Hansen and uh, some other uh, authors, as well as Amorins, who was not here anymore. He studies, uh, he just had to leave this morning, but he studies uh, domestic spaces, modernist domestic spaces in Brazil and has contributed a lot to the study of domestic space in the field of uh, space syntax. Uh, <clears throat> so in these previous studies, we went back to them and, and compare, put them together, the studies by Hansen and uh, Amorin. Hansen studies houses by uh, architects in Europe, uh, and then Amorin studies modernist uh, houses in, in, in Brazil. And uh, they use the idea of uh, rank order of space integration. And um, in the Brazilian households studied uh, by Amorin, the maid's bedroom is always the most segregated environment uh, of, of the system. Uh, only 25% of the entire sample of both uh, Hanson and, and Amorin uh, has a kitchen as a more <coughs> integrated space. So this is the previous studies that we looked at, just as a reference in terms of the methodology. <coughs> of course, they are different, completely different examples from the ones we are looking, but they, they were housing, uh, uh, the, the domestic spaces. And again, we were interested in this methodology of uh, analyzing the rank order of integration by um, uh, focusing on, on sectors, private sector, service sector, and social sector of the house towards question if there should be, we can come to a genotype uh, of, uh, of these sectors in these projects. So, so the question is, is that uh, whether this logic of modernist design of spaces was different in social housing projects that had collective systems of domestic services. So, <clears throat> so this is the, the previous uh, genotype established by Amorin and uh, um, uh, Hansen. And you can see here, P is the private, meaning bedrooms, service kitchens, and other laundry spaces. And S is the social uh, uh, living rooms and more uh, <clears throat> Less private spaces. Uh, here, so this is the first project. It was actually thought of to have another block here, but it ended up being built like this, an isolated laundry here, collective laundry, and uh, the housing and some, um, I wanna say like a event space here, but not household, none of the household collective chores were actually done in the same building block where people lived. So, and we looked into every, uh, each of these uh, projects, we looked into two cells, and the criteria was that the more recurrent cells within the, the same building block, and of course the access to floor plans that we, we had to have somehow in order to generate the, the, the plan. So these were the cells we looked for the Russian project. On some, these are how it's occupied today. Uh, the Unité, I'm gonna go, everybody knows the Unité, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and so women is shown here, but it's also shown like this. The other project is uh, the Rio de Janeiro project. This project was done, uh, I should just talk a little bit more about it because maybe it's less familiar to you. It was done by the Department of Popular Housing. An interesting fact is that uh, the Department of Popular Housing was run by a woman, Carmen Portinho, and uh, she had very firm ideas on certain, uh, of eliminating unnecessary spaces from the dwelling units, specifically laundries. Uh, so we wonder if that would affect what actually happens in the unit. Not so much, but a little bit better than the others. That's what we came to uh, find in the end. So that's the, the unit we look at. This is, you go up, it's a duplex, and this is a sort of like a T0 here. In, uh, in Lisbon, in, in Portugal. So this is very quickly some aspects uh, related to each of these projects. Uh, so we have some common aspects. I guess Pedregulho was the most specific ones in, on the speech. If you read the documentation on the conception of the project, it, there's also there's specific mention of um, eliminating this uh, uh, sort of house chore spaces from the, the, the housing. The, the unit. Um, <clears throat> and we looked at, at uh, this 
uh, ideas in the scale of the complex as a whole and then at the unit. So some, this, in, in this case is here, this is service space laundry and kitchen. This one, laundry here, of course it's a different typology, but segregation wise it's as, as segregated as the other ones, relatively speaking, and here that's the collective uh, laundry. So the physical continuity of, of the ground floor of these three complexes, they, uh, they, we, we, we see that, uh, that it occurs primarily in convivial spaces, not in the service areas. <clears throat> that's where it happens here, right there in Pedregulho, and uh, the unity. Uh, we ran um, convex uh, VGA analysis and X analysis of the, the block itself for the, the three projects and then the, the unit. And we can see here that the control, uh, the access to the housing units is marked by this lack of connection between service and leisure or gathering spaces. Um, <clears throat> this are some of the other analysis that's showing uh, where the laundry because we, we didn't do the, kit, the uh, collective kitchen for all three projects because we couldn't find exactly kitchen for all of them. Uh, Corbusier's project does not have a collective kitchen, so it was difficult to compare uh, one because the other one didn't have that same kind of space. So, um, so we, inside, the laundry, laundries are uh, obviously uh, integrated, easy for people to kind of see each other and work, but when it, when it comes to the relation of that space within the system, then that doesn't uh, necessarily happen. I'm just gonna go pretty quick. And then we went to the units, and 80% um, of the sample, um, in 80% of the sample anal analyzed, kitchens constitute segregated spaces compared to other dwelling spaces. And evident access restrictions to the service sector, it, obviously, if you compare it to the, to the uh, more social spaces, like living rooms and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> these are the uh, uh, VJ analysis for the units, and Pedregulio is uh, the one that uh, we thought, and you can see here, that's where the kitchen is, has slightly better um, interaction uh, between living spaces uh, maybe if you if you compare it to kitchens, um, <clears throat> the others also did some graph analysis of of, of three uh, cases. And in in eighty percent of them, a kitchen is at the same depth level, level as a living, so it's they are probably easily accessible um, kitchens in terms uh, if you compare it to the living spaces. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, this is overall picture of, of uh, what we analyzed. We have uh, you know, square footage, depth, uh, integration of every unit. And, um, and then we did it, uh, so sorry. Um, this is per complex, and now this is isolating the units themselves. So <clears throat> the morphology of the cells express a polarization of living spaces dedicated to performing household uh, activities. Um, however, if one, when we relate integration to visibility maps, then uh, the more integrated and visually connected spaces remain only in the social sector. Um, so somehow we can say that uh, there's some evidence that if we think that women by that time were mostly not formally employed but working in household chores, we can say that there's sexist aspects of society uh, can be attributed to the inaccessibility and absence of, of connections from those spaces with the remaining more social spaces within the units. Uh, and so, so the question, is there a genotype? Uh, is, is it the same or each one of the systems have their own genotype? Uh, so this is what we came up with. And uh, so Pedregulio has a more even uh, balance between social service and, and uh, private sectors, but on the others, it's pretty much they are all different, slightly different from from each other. But nevertheless, social is always more integrated than all the other spaces. So some of the conclusions would be uh, 
We couldn't find a common genotype, so each typology in these three cases have their own set of primary information. Uh, we found similarities in the position occupied by the service sector in the rank order of the integration sector. Uh, we also found that 40% uh, of the service sector remains in second position in all four, uh, sorry, five genotypes. Uh, uh, 20% of the service sex sector uh, is only 20% of the service sector scaled as uh, more integrated. And uh, overall, even though we're talking about different projects, if you compare the ones analyzed by Amorim and Hanson with those, um, 20% of our sample has identical genotypes to those ob observed by the other authors. And uh, also in common that service sector is the most segregated uh, within the system. Um, this is just an illustration of, because as we found here, that this is a more even uh, situation. Maybe it has to do with uh, the role that Carmen played in, uh, in the uh, direction of the Department of uh, Public Housing in Rio. We don't know that for sure, but it's, it's quite possible. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, the, I know it's a very preliminary uh, uh, finding, but we can say that at least in these structures, uh, it seems that uh, there's a sort of perpetuation of the gender stereotypes in the domestic uh, spaces. Um, going forward, um, Larissa couldn't be here, she's applying for her master's right now, but uh, going forward, we are looking into social housing spaces, especially in Northern Europe, that were designed by women under a participatory process. And then it would be interesting to kind of see if, if it's designed by women and, and having participation during the process. If something happens within the cell that reveals a more integrated spaces where there's less uh, separation between household chores and uh, living spaces. I guess that's it. Thank you. Hello. So, um, sorry. Um, I'm going um, to present now a part of an ongoing project of the research lab that's organizing the event. Um, we've been developing a software uh, for the analysis of three-dimensional space um, that is based on space syntax methodology. Um, it has actually uh, been presented uh, on Monday by Antonio on a work we did together with the uh, Apaisist uh, Design Studio. Um, so um, the software itself is operational and we're very um, enthusiastic about seeing it used for all kinds of um, uses. But a lot of it, it's still work in, process, in progress. And so here, I'll, I'll focus mostly on the problems we have encountered so far and how we've been dealing with them. Um, so this was initially going to be um, the final slides uh, of this presentation, as there are more of a note on future work. Um, but I also have to kind of call this uh, problem one and the sort of motivation for us. Um, because, well, you, you guys probably noticed that we have been taking you to all these places with very great views. So you are very aware that Porto is not really a flat city. And it kind of makes sense that it's a research lab based on the city that would first encounter the necessity of um, creating the software. Uh, obviously, uh, space syntax has not been oblivious to the question of topography and three-dimensionality. And this problem has been approached before. Um, but what we have been finding is that uh, a three-dimensional approach um, is, besides being a possible solution for these problems that space syntax has been encountered, in, encountering, um, and being able to incorporate three-dimensional qualities into it, it's also a tool that allows us to discover uh, new problems and new ways of dealing with spatial analysis. So for those who don't know, um, so, um, adapting uh, the two-dimensional metho methodology meant 
a shift in the conceptual model. Traditionally, in VGA analysis, we have something like this, which is a, a space parti um, partitioned by a grid in a squared grid, where all the points are put in relation with each other. And uh, is this relation, when analyzed in different ways, that's the basis for the different measures developed in space syntax methodology. When the model is three-dimensional, uh, then our grid starts looking at something like this, and we can not look at all the points in the same way anymore. Uh, it's kind of obvious and intuitive that um, now uh, we have a set of points that represent the space where people can actually be, and so the space from where they see um, the globality of spaces. And then all the space and surfaces that are seen from those points. So this results in both a series of different representations for the analysis of space, uh, but in different types, types of analysis as well. You can still have the same type uh, of traditional two-dimensional analysis from all the viewing points in the grid to each other, and then uh, which we have on the first picture there. Um, we have also the analysis of all the scene surfaces and scene space from all the viewing points. And then we have something that we haven't really not explored, but we are, are planning on doing, uh, which is the analysis of the entire spatial grid, which we, be we believe could bring very interesting concepts to the analysis of architectural form and style. So this is one of the problems that initially brought us to want to study Casa da Musica, a uh, building by AMA in the center of Porto. It's uh, in the business center of the city in a roundabout that marks the beginning of a six kilometers long axis connecting the center of, of the city to the western side of it, to the ocean. Um, in it, when, it, the, when the project appeared, it was um, a controversial decision to have it there. And at the time, it generated this big public debate on placing a big architectural object in the center of the city. It was often compared to the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao and the uh, effect it had there. So what we said to understand was, um, was a very three-dimensional problem how great an impact the building really had in the area where it was built. Um, so we defined the area to study uh, as the roundabout garden that you see there, the plot where the building is, um, which also encompasses a large area of AMA design collective exterior space, and the beginning of the streets leading up to it. Um, so this was the first time we encountered the problem of trees and vegetation uh, when doing a three-dimensional analysis of visibility. I'm not going to explain this in detail because Antonio already presented it in a much more developed version of the approach he took to this problem. But very quickly, um, this is when we started working on integrating into the software the ability to generate geometries to which we could give attributes. In this case, uh, the case of trees, we gave them percentage of transparency according to different times of the year. In the summer, they would be almost opaque, greatly impacting the visibility people have in the area. And in the winter, they would allow for much greater comprehension of buildings that define space. So this gave us two sets of results, um, one for summer, for summer month and the other for winter month, um, that we kept comparing. Um, so we have summer months um, below and winter months uh, up there. Uh, and then we also took advantage of the ability that we had to define which points can see space uh, and created different paths for different ways uh, of people perceiving the space according to where they are and the way they use it. So in this image, um, I'm showing you this three different, four, four different paths. Um, one from inside the roundabout, where uh, like the people cross to get from one side of the other of 
uh, that area at a height of two meters, which is a bit taller than eyesight. Um, then the view from the streets a bit lower because uh, that there's people in cars. Um, a view from the on a designed public space, and the view from the window, the big window of Casa de Musica. So. Um, what we can see, going back to the problem of monumentally and urban impact, is that Casa de Musica, well, definitely an architectural object that searched to separate itself from what's around it, doesn't really have this Guggenheim-ish quality of monumentality that people were so afraid at at the time. In fact, uh, only when we only take into account the space surrounding the building, uh, is it more vis visible than the rest of the buildings that define that space? Uh, regarding this space like, uh, surrounding the Casa de Musica, we were all, all able to collaborate with Anton Tejada, who was studying movement patterns of people around the building for his master thesis in Galicia's Higher School of Education using video tracking. And, um, while I'm not going to try to go into detail on the complexities of what he did and the way he captured the different kinds of ways people use the space, uh, it was very interesting for us to be able to compare and exchange results with him as an empirical basis for what we were doing. And now I'm quickly trying to show a much different problem that was more um, it's so more of a practical application of three-dimensional analysis of visibility into the organization of a more controlled space. So um, these kinds of retail spaces have been studied in space syntax, often with, in parallel with empirical data. And res results uh, systematically show that how people behave in these spaces depends on a very complex set of variables that go beyond the spatial qualities. So for example, it often depends on pre-knowledge people have of ex expected spatial relations between products, and also of a set of visual cues and information that is made available to people in these spaces. So um, like, you have information signs telling you where things are, um, you have promotional ads bringing you to certain points of space, and So we have chosen to study the layout of an existing supermarket so that we could have, besides the plan and the detail of the expositive elements, um, information on some key products and where they were located. That, and these are things that most people you search for when they go to a supermarket. Um, and um, so here, here we have the model. Um, and uh, these are horizontal sections of space that go from meter to meter. And the top ones are at ground level going up to the ceiling. And uh, what was interesting about this analysis is that it allowed us to understand that the areas that at eye level are not really visible uh, are exactly the same that you can see the best when looking up at information on the ceiling. Uh, and um, the thing about this case was that it was a very small case, so it was faster to compute and faster to model and we could really experiment on it. And so um, what we wanted was to experiment with all the kinds of uh, three-dimensional of kinds of the representations that the three-dimensional model allowed for. And they did all give us different um, information about space. Um, we have there um, on, the, on your left um, the identification of points in space that can see most of uh, other points in space. So in this case, we don't, didn't use the we didn't define the viewing point as being on the ground, as, as being up there. So we could, for example, understand where you could uh, place security cameras. 
and then on the other image you have, you, we go back to having people standing on the floor and we identify, for example, a good location to uh, put the security guard. Um, so, okay, I'm going back to um, the slides that I showed at the beginning that I intended to be at the end as notes on future work. We are now working on three major things, uh, and I think I have touched very lightly on them during the presentation, which is, well, the, um, first off, when it, we are meant to integrate this with CAD tools so that modeling something as large as the center of the historical center of Porto doesn't take so much time and it's more operational and we may finally uh, properly uh, approach the motivational problem. Um, also, um, we ne still need to, uh, to adapt uh, spacing tax measures. So far we've worked with analysis of visibility but we haven't yet looked at how we can really take advantage of three-dimensionality when using space index measures. And the third one relates to this last one, and is to explore what, three -dimensional, what the three-dimensional grid can get us in terms of spatial and architectural analysis. So, thank you. <laughs> But um, I'd like to propose for the others to put and to, uh, to make some questions to generate the debate. So, um, I, I just. Okay. <laughs> Stretch. <laughs> so, um, I will have uh, three questions for three of you. Uh, first, I would like to start with the first, Anna Louisa. Um, to you, it's, it's not a, a question, it's, it's more like um, a suggestion in case of the, um, of the research will go on. I don't know if it will or not, but um, I enjoyed very much your presentation, particularly thinking that you are a, a, a master student yet. Um, as I saw that uh, Vinicius Neto is one of your references, um, I know that now is working on, on something that could be um, a further step for your research. Uh, you showed us a map that revealed a um, configurational approach. You were trying to understand the system of streets. Then you showed us another map with the distribution of income and tried to relate those two things is something that is being explored by, by space syntax and by other configurational uh, approaches. Um, the thing that uh, Vinicius is trying to do now is to, when you go to that map of the distribution of income, you have people living in each of these street blocks. And what he does is to study what these people do during the day they turn their cell phones on and so it traces their movement along the city so that it can uh, understand in in which streets of a city in the case is rio de janeiro in which streets of a system of the city do poor people uh, get in touch with rich people i'm simplifying but uh, he is really um, achieving a more dynamic reading of this relation between the urban form and society uh, income in this, uh, in this. So if you want to pursue this uh, line of research, perhaps uh, talking to Vinicius could be a, a, good, a good thing. Uh, so I don't have a question, it's just this. So th the second would be for the second Anna Luisa. Uh, I've also enjoyed very much your, your presentation, and mine would be um, like a, a genuine question. It's not a provocative one like Franklin would do. It's, it, it's more like a, a genuine. And um, let's pretend that we don't know Julian Hansen, 
let's pretend that we don't know a Morin. Uh, do you think that when we look at uh, an application um, of space syntax to the city, take for instance the map of Caterina, the city of Porto, she showed very fast uh, an axial map. So she was studying the city with space syntax. Then um, you could be studying very complex buildings. For instance, in Brazil, uh, Valerio Medeiros studies um, uh, legislative power uh, buildings, or you, it could be hospitals or universities like Teresa Eitor does. Uh, so this is two different things. Then you can have, uh, for instance, Caterina showed um, uh, a retail. And then you could have, for instance, a house with just 30 meters square. Do you think that the relevance of space syntax tools is the same when we go through these different, so different things? And uh, so this would be the second. If Katarina wants to answer to that, it's also OK. And um, my question to, to Katarina would be, uh, somehow, uh, somewhere along the, your presentation, you told us that uh, um, your anal analysis of uh, Casa da Musica, if I understood it well, uh, revealed that it was a non-disturbing building, and that to me came as... Um, I, I, I'm not questioning the relevance of it to be disturbing, because I think it has the relevance to be disturbing. Uh, I think the location also asks for something disturbing. What I'm asking is you to find it not disturbing. So that's it. Um, what the analysis showed us uh, was that as an architectural building, it's not disturbing. It doesn't disturb. Um, the rules of the urban area around it. I, living in Porto, I think it's a very disturbing building and it's in its content, more than in, it, in its form. Um, if you're asking for my personal opinion as, as someone who really knows the area. And uh, I know I didn't really get into it because it was not really the scope of the presentation, but I did show a bit of Anton's work uh, and how we, what he analyzed was the different types of ways people use the collective space around it, the exterior space. With, so there you have the skate for us, the, skate, the skaters, you have the businessmen, you have all these kinds of people who use it in, um, in very different ways and very actively. So honestly, I think that um, the analysis makes a lot of sense because the building in itself, it's not disturbing, but the, the complete um, uh, intervention of Oma in that place has changed the place. So it's not necessarily a, as a big object that fell there. So I think that's my answer to I would just like to say that I'm familiar with the Vinicius work and that he used big dot, big data, I think, from Twitter and other kind of big data. And for us, we had a short period of time for the analysis and we were trying to use the so uh, software that's been developed in the university, Numeropolis, but at the time, it wasn't finished yet, so we had to use Medidas Urbanas, which is kind of an old software. It still works, but uh, we had a limitation of the data and the information we could add at that moment for the time that it took for the calculations and the, the proceedings. But yes, of course, I'll take it. I, I think that what you did for your master, it, it's quite good. The suggestion would be like if you want to go to a PhD or something. Could be yeah, I'm still working on my master's. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, so, so your question was if uh, space syntax is relevant when you're talking about different sort of com complexity levels in buildings? Is that? Yes. Uh, and, and in cities, 
starting from the city until, for instance, Farnsworth House. Is it the same? Is as relevant when we are looking at uh, London as when we are looking to a small house, open? Uh, I think that. Uh, in I, I think I, I would answer like that. I think when we're studying domestic spaces, specifically, convex analysis is very useful. And uh, I think that's the strength of, of what we presented here. But when it comes to axial analysis for the interior uh, of the structures, I don't think in that case it's very relevant. But in the city, definitely more relevant than the building. So. But I, I would say that space syntax does reveal, it, yes, it's relevant, but uh, I, I, I don't know, I cannot tell you how much more relevant it is for the bigger scale. Or in my work right now, I'm studying museums, in, uh, and we were presenting this paper yesterday on, on the Museum of Unlimited Growth by Le Corbusier and uh, um, the Guggenheim. They were both spiral schemes, but the analysis of space syntax revealed things that Apparently the models, uh, or just the 3D vi visualization of those models did not show that. So, so I, I do think that uh, it's, it's, it's relevant. And, 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 but specifically for buildings, I think convex analysis. Does that, yes. does that help? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's some kind of answer uh, uh, to Victor. It's uh, about the analysis of Casa da Musica. Well, um, what uh, we discovered in uh, space index analysis and uh, even in uh, Casa da Musica, although flat, it was important as 3D analysis because of the presence of the, um, the vegetation, the, the trees. And uh, we discovered uh, this. That the visibility of Casa da Musica is not different from the visibility of any other building in, uh, uh, around, in the roundabout and the uh, next streets. We, and uh, we, go, we go there, and if we want to see Casa da Musica, it's not very easy to see Casa da Musica. Uh, and uh, it's only reduced to, to, to that uh, uh, part of the city, because if you want to, in the... Boa Vista Avenue, it's impossible to see Casa da Musica only in its end. Uh, well, the days of East uh, of Casa da Musica is very, very little. The, uh, and we demonstrate that. So I think the Ram Coolers had to, uh, and uh, that uh, makes that uh, Casa da Musica is uh, not monumental uh, in many of the factors that uh, define monument. So I think uh, Rem Kulas had to make another strategy to make that a monument, and it is the architectural form. <laughs> it's the Gary effect. Something very odd that, uh, well, uh, that uh, makes the attention to Casa da Music, but not the visibility. Uh, accessibility and uh, any other parameters uh, uh, relating uh, to the, the strategy of Ram Coolers, I think what, uh, it's not uh, a big uh, thing that is seen from uh, anywhere, as usual with a big uh, avenue, uh, it's uh, another strategy. Uh, if we want to be mean, we would say the, the roundabout was um, uh, refurbished by Alvaro Cisa, uh, well, more or less in the same time that uh, uh, Avenida dos Aliados. Uh, in Avenida dos Aliados, Alvaro Cisa cut the trees, all, all of them, uh, uh, making the visibility, for example, of city all very, very bright. <laughs> Uh, and all the buildings there. Uh, and uh, in uh, Boa Vista, he maintained completely the, the trees. I think uh, Alvaro Cisa cut the visibility of uh, Rem Kulas. <laughs> this is a very provocative. <laughs> I don't know if it's provocative enough. But, uh, well, it's a... Uh, uh, 
Of course, because the music is, uh, is different. It meets the eyes by other means, not by uh, a very high degree of visibility from any place in, the, in our city. Uh, hi, uh, to Anna. Uh, you said that uh, to have the shape uh, of the, the, the blocks, you get from a file from IBGE, right? But then you had to draw uh, the streets. And then this is the, the question. You, you manually draw it, uh, or did you get any coding for uh, image retrieving to get this the street for you? And then uh, the second question would be, this kind of analysis that you did, it was um, easy or, or quick to do, so that you could reproduce it in many other cities easily, or it's very time costing, so just time to do one city at a... Um, for the city of Biruba, because it's a very small city, uh, we chose to hand draw using CAD programs, all the street segments, but you can transform using uh, GIS software transformed the VG blocks into street segments. Um, it wasn't that much time consuming. The hardest part was to get the data and to organize it. Uh, for instance, to, to get all the location for the retail establishments. I know that in Brazil you have uh, KINEF, which gives you the information of the data, but I couldn't really use. So I had to go there and check all the retail establishments which was the, the most time-consuming part. But for the calculations, it was actually really fast. In half a day, everything was finished, and we were already analyzing the results. Uh, but that's because we used only one attribute, that was the income, and only towards the retail establishment. So I think that if you start adding more attributes, it will take more time, but it can definitely be redone in other cities. And uh, one, one of the, um, the objects that you've presented um, caught my attention, which is a retail building. I had a chance to work uh, for a company in developing some strategic analysis for the um, rearrangement of the, of the layout. And one of the things that um, we figured out was that space syntax couldn't help that much uh, in terms of what they had previously studied in terms of um, impulse, uh, consumption, consumption society, etc. Meaning that they had already a strategy to make you buy uh, things that you didn't want to buy at that, uh, before you enter the building. And of course, uh, visual analysis um, is now really, really good to, to deal with things that at that time, at that time, we, we didn't have the tool. And the, what you've presented was much more, uh, uh, I would say, space-to-space -space observation. But in retail building, what you must do is not space-to-space -space observation, but space object uh, view. Um, uh, in simple terms, uh, which are the products that are in the, lower, the lowest um, places, or the ones which are on uh, your eye view, uh, yeah, the eye position. And the sequence of products, they're offered to you while you're moving along the alleys. So I think that's the, the, the tricky thing about studying retail uh, buildings. It's exactly dealing with the relationship between movement and what you see, no, not in terms of space to space, but space object in which sequence you have. So then you will start, you will be able to start to talk the same language as, as they, they are interested in, 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 in having this kind of conversation. So in this, in this sense, it's not a question, it's just trying to um, change the model a little bit. And instead of doing space-to-space -space analysis, space-to-object uh, visual analysis. Uh, yes, but uh, it's perhaps maybe presentation not very explicit because it's it's really uh, it's the viewing uh, uh, person to the viewed object it's there 
it's it's there. Uh, and uh, what you said, it is uh, it's real. The space index analysis is not uh, enough because uh, well, there is a, a very discussed uh, question: is the Newtonian question or the weight question or the gravity question in uh, in space index? And we think in a supermarket uh, shopping is absolutely necessary to consider that there are weights. And, uh, well, the Sonai and the, the, the big uh, chains of supermarkets, they, they know that, and they put the rice in some place. And, and uh, it's because of that that we produce another, uh, another uh, model using agent uh, Based analysis, you can see in the televisions. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, we uh, in that model we have attractors and uh, consumers' uh, behavior, uh, and it's it brings us uh, something more that the space index can uh, cannot uh, uh, bring to us. <laughs> I made a research uh, um, with space syntax some years ago, and um, one of the conclusions, because it was a multidisciplinary project, and, um, and we work with uh, different disciplines, and it was really important to work with the uh, social uh, methods, and we work with anthropologists um, uh, to, to, to make the connection with the, uh, the site, with the place, with the people. And, um, and it, you, you have to be really careful because the conclusions of space syntax were completely opposite of the conclusions of the social method and the, the work um, with, the, with the people. And because it, it, it was not the visible, as the physical aspects that were related with the, the main question of the research, uh, we could not see it. Uh, it was invisible, and uh, and that aspects are really important to make a study of a place, um, because for several years we know we have methods to um, to know places, to make researches about sp uh, uh, places, about perception, about use, um, and uh, this is one more is a. Uh, uh, a method that relates with maps and can uh, give us a um, um, way to perceive the, the place, but we have to be careful to use only these factors, uh, uh, because if not, the conclusion is not going to help you. For example, the kitchen, the laundry, uh, yes, is perpetuating in the space, in architectural space. I'm curious about the, the new step of the research related with the participation project and the things that you are saying that you are going to do. Because you know from the beginning of the century, kitchen, uh, laundry keeps almost the same, doesn't have uh, any kind of transformation. And, um, and even the, the city, the places of retail, stores, related with the, the city center, yes, we know that people use um, almost uh, uh, every every time that place is. But my my sh my question and um, is related with the first in, uh, presentation because I was really curious and and I thought it was really interesting the the thematic, and even more when you said that you wanted to understand how um, this uh, movement, uh, for example, of Sephardic Jews, and uh, that is a theme that I study and, uh, here in Portugal, and I work with the um, University of Lisbon about the Sephardic Jews here in Portugal during history and now, and uh, the visa gold and so on, and I was curious to know how this could be represented, this research, research could be represented in a 3D, uh, three-dimensional uh, representation. And you use Islamic representations, and I don't understand why. Because the cultural fields are completely different. Visible are mainly uh, Chinese communities, for example. 
Sephardic Jews are not Islamic, they don't have Islamic representation. Why these Islamic patterns to try to give a 3D representation? Maybe I didn't deliver the, it's very clear in the presentation. Um, in these cases we used, that one was specifically related to Turkey and Portugal. Uh, ah, that uh, one specifically was related with the Golden Visa and Sephardic Jews was specifically related from Turkey to Portugal case. And the second one was uh, specifically related to Morocco, Spain, and third one Tunisia, Italy. So first uh, we uh, started with general issues of migration and then we ended up with specific countries. And we use each case, uh, in that case we use the specific, uh, we use Islamic geometric patterns because in Portugal, Spain, uh, Tunisia, Italy, Morocco, Turkey, and uh, Italy, we see these patterns that they exist. And this is a kind of a universal techniques that we're using that time to, uh, and it's still, today it's still vis uh, visually visible in these countries. So with Sephardic Jews and Golden Visa, our uh, focus was on Turkey, Portugal, relationship between Turkey and Portugal, and we, uh, Merge the tile pattern from Turkey with the tile pattern from, uh, from uh, Portugal. Mm -hmm. So we see an object and from far away we don't understand what it is, but if, uh, if we are in the correct standpoint, we see that it is related from Turkey to Portugal because mm -hmm. it represents, when we go around it, it's the, the, the visual distortion of the perspective represents the flow, uh, the flow from Turkey to Portugal. This is what we wanted to represent. Mm -hmm. okay. And so also there is, uh, in Turkey, this is a... That 3D uh, object uh, relates with letters that, that uh, are related with the research you are making of the movements. Yeah, it yeah. is related to flow of people. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkish, gold, uh, in the Golden Visa case, um, measured that Turkey constitutes mm -hmm. one third of the Golden Visa applications. Mm -hmm. And also there is a recently increasing number of Sephardic Jews that are mm -hmm. yeah. accessing dual nationality from Turkey and Portugal. Mm -hmm. So okay. our, uh, in the mm -hmm. Golden Visa case, there is also Chinese, but our focus was from Turkey to Portugal. Okay. Okay. Can, I, can I just say something? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's quick. Uh, I think that it, the, your question is still in my head. I'm, I'm thinking here. Yeah. <laughs> and now you've kind of pointed towards the same direction. And I think what we've been seeing here is a bunch of efforts towards complementary processes and towards space syntax. So I think that that's uh, it's got to be relevant if we're still trying to somehow bring new uh, other ways of complementing some polemical issues like the ones you just said it here. In my case, I'm trying to bridge it with neuroscience. I, I, it's in the early stages of it, and um, it could be a way out of certain sort of personal issues of the level of the user instead of the, the pattern of uh, like sp the scale of space syntax. So I guess bringing down the scale and comparing to the bigger one could be a path, and, and the 3D isovis together with I think neuroscience, for instance, could point towards some direction of still proving that it's relevant, but it needs to be like sort of complemented. Okay, maybe we should finish to have lunch. Thank you so much. Bye.